you know who has access to what? This is the Identity at the Center podcast. If you're looking for identity and access management talk, you've come to the right place. And now, on to the show. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff, and that's Jim. That's me, right over here. That's you. Today's show, we're going to talk about surprises, both good and bad, that Jim and I have seen in IAM programs over the years. Before we get to the IAM stuff, though, Jim, let's talk about some of the non-IAM surprises that we've come across in our many, many travels. And we want to talk about good surprises here, good right? Surprises. Or is it open? Okay. So, well, okay, yeah. Let's keep it one safer work. <laughs> <laughs> and uh let's try to keep it positive and obviously not call any specific people or entity out um if we don't have to okay we're friends with I everybody can, i i can live with those confines especially when really what i would talk about in terms of surprises or or about with anything non i am i want to talk about snacks snacks yeah. and yeah so Good surprises would primarily focus on food. Mm -hmm. And there was, you know, one particular client who, much love to them, they had the best snack bar on every floor of (laughs) any company that I ever visited, you know, as a full time employee or as a consultant ever, and everything was free. Yeah. Best snacks and the best dining hall cafeteria experience. I mean, blew the others away. Yeah, that was um, that was a legendary food at a client experience. I think. I mean, it was just, uh-huh. yeah. I mean, and we're talking like not even like cheap snacks, right? Like Hershey bars laying <laughs> around. Yeah. I mean, stuff that like if you were thinking like, in a normal company, it'd be like you know penny pinching, and it's tough to get even like a coffee machine into the break room, you know, a Craig yeah. or something like that. But yeah, there's like you know candy bars. There's you know beer, wine. I mean. This was definitely um, head and shoulders over, you know, I think every other company that at least that I've ever seen or been a part of. Yeah. Now, the only drawback of of that particular place was that the parking was not so great. But they had a policy where um, you could take an Uber to work. And I think that was, it was either covered or something like that. I mean, very generous employee benefits, I think. Yeah, it actually right. made me, I've been working from home now for over 10 years and I love it. I mm-hmm. love working from home. I love the freedom of, you know, kind of rolling out of bed and jumping on the computer and not having to sit in rush hour. And I did that for many years. Wait, too. you roll out of bed and get jump on the computer? You don't just I, pop open the laptop right there? <laughs> <laughs> there, there have been, there have been those days, believe me. <laughs> Uh, but I used to do, you know, the the normal rush hour commute like everyone else. So I love working from home. But that particular client, I was like, I would come into the office here. <laughs> Just for the food. Free and then you come in for breakfast. Really good. For lunch, free lunch. And um, then go home. my speed. And then go home. <laughs> I'd be there to eat. Yeah. I'm not here to work. I'm here to take advantage of the free food. And, uh, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> I'd like to start working weekends as well. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, you'd like to work cafeteria hours. How about that? There you go. There you go. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting when you bring up the rideshare thing. I was just thinking, I mean, it's, it's an interesting um, benefit, right. For those employees. Um, and theoretically, you know, something that could be, you know, a little more eco-friendly as well by having more shared ride kind of credits out there. It solves the problem of the, of the um, parking, but, you know, convenience too. I think if people could take a Uber or a Lyft to work every day and it was, you know, economically viable uh, and the availability of it was there, why not? Right. I think the biggest thing is telecommuting. Then, yeah. you know, you don't create any, any extra <laughs> solution. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think there's still a culture paradigm in some organizations where you, everybody needs to be in the same place. Yeah. Um, and then other organizations are much more open to it. And, you know, my personal opinion is you can get a lot done telecommuting and, you know, conference, web conference calls. And I see a lot of organizations succeeding with, you know, 
a large part of their workforce being remote or you know in, in separate cities and things like that so why couldn't you just as well do it where people are working from home it, it does kind of come down to trust and i think it's probably more appropriate for certain roles than others but i don't know i've always been a big fan of it and you know me personally i make sure that i'm getting my work done because i know that it's a two-way trust yeah that trust i think is the big thing though you know, companies I've worked with in the past or worked for in the past, that's always been kind of a slow roll. It was no, not at all to, you know, once a month or something like that. And then it became kind of like, well, you know, Fridays or Friday half days like that. But I agree. I mean, I think the majority of people, you know, will treat it correctly. There will always be kind of bad apples among the bunch that might take advantage of a policy or something like that. But, you know, I look at it and I don't know if I've talked about this before, but like the, the Apple model, of self-service sales, right? Where you can go into the app and buy a product and then literally walk in a store, take it on a shelf and walk out. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, they might have tightened up just a little bit here and there, but they've designed a shopping experience that meets the needs of the 98% of the people who, you know, will do the right thing. And they have sunk less into the 2% that are going to take advantage of it that they would have had loss anyway. I kind of take the same approach for, you know, work from home, telecommute, but even from an IM perspective, you know, don't design for the 1%, design for the vast majority of other users or things that are going to provide a much broader benefit rather than getting bogged down in one or two things. Yeah, I generally agree. You know, I see, um, I, well, I definitely agree with the philosophy, um, that particular use case where it's um, people able to check out without, you know, without having kind of the traditional, maybe, maybe the belief is that, hey, the traditional model doesn't provide additional security. Uh, but when I go to grocery stores now, I'm, I'm finding more and more of them have self-checkout. And I wonder, I'm like, you know, it could be so, I mean, I wouldn't even think of stealing something, but it crossed my mind that it's like, hey, how would they know if I, you know, I had five candy bars and I only swiped three of them or, Pressure you know, plates. Sometimes I'll, I'll hold five. Well, I don't even think it's, I don't even really think that that actually works. Sometimes yeah. I, you know, I'm holding a quantity of four and I'll just take one of them and scan it four times and throw all four in the bag. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes I won't even put it in the bag. I'll just put it on right in the cart. And so I, I wonder, okay, how are they, how are they not losing money by doing it this way? Yeah. Um, and then I also wonder, okay, you know, so if you, there's usually somebody sitting nearby who's not really paying attention, but are they maybe profiling people um, and determining whether or not they look like they could be uh, someone who would steal something? And that's where I would think you could run into some potential legal issues if that is happening. Yeah. I mean, that's something that props up uh pretty much I think universally no matter where you're at but you know the concept is it's a frustrating experience doing the self-checkout thing because you know scan item scan item again remove item from bag I mean it's just not it's not a great user experience sometimes and they have the uh the overseer there right the employee who's kind of watching all the checkout lines and comes over and helps out where needed but Anyway, I think we're getting a little bit off track. You think so? (laughs) Yeah, this is, yeah, welcome to the um, self-checkout podcast. Um, Now, so we talked about food. Let's get back on track. Uh, Talked about food at one place. I'm going to continue that theme in that we were in Stevens Point, Wisconsin recently and found an amazing sushi place. I actually ate there twice (laughs) while I was there. (laughs) I I mean... You don't think, I mean, that was always, I think I I ate sushi for the first time like 15 years ago. And I remember thinking at the time I'd only want to eat sushi somewhere close to the ocean. Mm -hmm. And I've had some of my best sushi experiences in, you know, the heartland of this country, which is nowhere near the ocean. Mm -hmm. And I think that the way it operates today is that, you know, they get the fish in, they, they package it in airtight containers and freeze it and ship it to wherever it's going by FedEx and it arrives just as good of shape whether you're 10 miles from the ocean or a thousand miles from the ocean right so then it comes down to what is the skill of the sushi chef 
the skill, the creativity, right? How they put things together. I mean, I'm relatively new in the sushi side. It's not something that I have traditionally been involved with, but my wife got me into it, I'd say about a year ago. So I'm waiting, waiting in slowly, but I enjoyed that, that, uh, that sushi place there. Yeah, and next good. year you'll be eating mackerel sashimi and it'll be a whole new world for you. <laughs> I'm a growing boy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no longer just cheese sandwiches and peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> Being more adventurous in the culinary I want to be a real boy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> any other non-IEM surprises before we jump into IEM surprises that you can think of? Um, yeah, just uh, one negative thing that I've come across recently with small airports is that mm. if you're planning on getting in late, um, try to survey the availability of Lyft and taxis ahead of time to the extent that you can. Um, I had two small airport experiences where I got in late. There were no taxis at the taxi stand. There was nobody available to help to ask for help. Um, I ordered lifts, no one picked up my ride, and I had to rent a car with a limited quantity of cars available because I got in there so late and everything had been rented out already. Mm -hmm. um, so, I don't know. <laughs> a little. <laughs> I, I've been a road warrior for 20 years and I never ran into that before. I mean, I've run into times where they've been out of rental cars, but usually then at least you can just go grab a taxi. But you're flying into a really small airport um, like Augusta, Georgia, or um, what was it, Central Wisconsin Airport. Those are the <laughs> yeah. two that got me. Uh, I would say make sure you have a rental car lined up if you're getting there late. Yeah, I think doing a little recon probably makes sense. You never know what you're going to get in those little small airports. So, That's it. Um, all right, well, let's shift gears. Let's talk about surprises that we've seen in the IAM space. Um, Let's start with something where you had a surprise where you found a customer was doing something right. Right. And um, th this is one that I, I go back to a lot because there's a particular client, I would say their IT maturity level overall wasn't really that high. And from an IAM perspective, they were doing things very manually. So and they, they were a growing organization they didn't have a, a very large workforce. They had a lot of partners that they worked with. So they kind of had manual processes that were good manual processes and they hadn't automated them yet. And, you know, in terms of doing authentication, single sign on, they were using free tools. So like ADFS, uh, which isn't necessarily bad in and of itself, but it, it wasn't very progressive. But then you looked at their privilege access management and they were using, I think they were using CyberArk and they were doing privilege session management for all their servers. Um, they were password vaulting all the other accounts that they, they couldn't do PSM for, and they were managing service accounts. And it was like, guys, you're at like a maturity level three or four when it comes to privilege access management. <laughs> like at a, at a maturity level one for so many of the other areas of IAM, you don't even really have an IAM program. What kind of drove you to this level of, of investment and this level of excellence. Well, they had a security incident. And so I think, unfortunately, that's what it takes so many times. I mean, going in, we talked to clients about privilege access management, and you can attest to this, Jeff, is like a lot of times the, the story is falling on deaf ears or, you know, somebody really cares about it, but they have a hard time articulating why it's important to spend all this money to manage the access of people we trust that's really what ends up happening is that usually when we talk to a client they say all right we've got a small group of people who have the keys to the kingdom and we trust them you know more or less and that's what happened with this particular organization they had a small group of people that they trusted but they still had a they still had um i think it was a phishing attack that somebody wound up coughing up the credentials and so they were able to very quickly articulate what the problem was and, and address it. But I think in the end, they put themselves in a much better place. They reduced the attack vector significantly and the keys of the kingdom, I thought they were doing a very good job with. Yeah. I remember that being like a high point for 
I mean, obvious high point too. That was like one of their strengths when we were kind of assessing the overall program there was that it was all the stuff they're doing on the privilege access management. Um, there's one that I can think of recently that from a client that we were working with, it's, it's loosely related to IAM and it's around their IT service management. I thought that they had done a really good job of kind of pulling in this new technology that they were going to be moving to. They were really kind of treating it like a product and had a clear plan for that, which, you know, ITSM has some reachings into IM in that, you know, you need a place to create tickets and how do you want to handle workflows and requests and stuff like that. And I remember seeing a, a new product from, uh, from Remedy on that uh, digital workplace uh, product. And I was like, okay, this is interesting. I can see how this might work together. Um, but the, the team that was kind of rolling that out or just getting underway with that seemed to, to kind of really be on point with it. Yeah, I remember that one too. So that was, yeah, excellent, excellent point. And um, yeah, I think one thing that, I think one thing that people will get up and cheer for uh, is when you have an impact to the end user and you improve the end user experience. And that's why it's sometimes harder to justify security only projects, things that exist in the background there's not a real end user benefit. Um, but at the same time, I mean, I, you know, the, the counter to that argument is that I think people are starting to get security a lot more and, and every, you know, data breaches are front page of the Wall Street Journal on a regular basis and um, nobody wants to become the victim of that. Yeah, but it's also a little bit of a numbing effect too. It's happening everywhere all the time. You know, it's like, okay, yeah, another breach. Who was it this time? Okay, what do I need to do? You know, those sorts of things. Right. Um, and it's unfortunate that it takes it takes an event sometimes for a company to invest in that sort of thing. And sometimes it takes multiple events. Um, you know, when, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when <laughs> you're going to get breached. So right. do you want to be proactive with it or not? And, you know, somewhere there's a risk calculation being made as to whether or not they want to invest X number of dollars to solve for you know, whatever potential risk um, that those dollars would go towards mitigating. It's Dude, a shame it's not the world. Yeah, I, I actually, um, I was just having a thought and I, it's a little off topic, but I want to share it uh, because we were working with a client recently um, and this person was expressing some kind of frustration uh, that she was dealing with uh, in terms of they had a, a workforce where there was not much turnover and you know you and I have both worked in places where um, there are a lot of people with 30 years or plus of tenure and there's you know in IT and maybe managing an application maybe the application is still running on the same hardware uh, from 30 years ago and you know they're just they're they're experts at the business and they're experts in their application and you know that can be a little intimidating um, my advice to to this person was that you know be you know be an expert in what you can be an expert in being able to talk intelligently about risk and about information security and trends that are happening in the workspace or in the uh, in cyberspace if you will about um, you know security events and data breaches I mean that is an important part of the conversation you're not going to be able to to have thirty years of experience or convince this person that you know more about their job than they do. However, there are things that you can know and you can build your career around uh, having your having expertise in, a, in another area where most people in the company really don't understand or are really able to converse with in a very intelligent way. Yeah, and I think that's what really makes a good IM program manager specifically is you don't have to be the most technical person in the world, but you have to know your product, meaning what is it you're trying to put in place from an IAM perspective, how does it help and how are the different pieces going to play together and how do you share that message? And I think having that knowledge and being able to articulate it well goes a long way. There's always going to be someone smarter than you in the room. <laughs> so know yeah. your stuff at least. And, you know, part of that is critical thinking is how do you apply the solutions that you have in your tool belt to the issues that the company or the business unit or the team is facing um, with, you know, what you've got to play with. And if it's not something you have today, you know, go research it, look for something that, that will fit that, that bill. Yeah. And I think that, you know, building a, a the, the area of information security and identity and access management in particular is an area that is growing 
and there's a lot of space for people who want to dive in and there's a lot of knowledge out there and there are a lot of people who I think would um, like to mentor other people. So it's a great area. I would recommend that, you know, if it's an area that you're just breaking into, do what you can to get to conferences, uh, participate in whatever forums are available, um, either in your area or online and get to know people and, and really just dive in. I mean, I think there's an area where you make a very good living and you can really establish some expertise and build a career uh, based on it. Yeah, definitely. Things like Identiverse, that conference is a good one, I think, to go to. I think there's Gartner coming up. You know, that's, I think there's a variety of choices and a variety of methods, YouTube videos, all sorts of things. Um, yeah. But I mean, if you have no like, money to get started, YouTube videos is where I would, I would head and then see where it takes you. Yeah, YouTube is still valuable, even, you know, for me, looking up stuff and taking a look at what's out there and trying to, you know, research different topics and see what's out there. I, I Jeff, prefer the YouTube. To, <laughs> yeah, no, we, we talked to a vendor um, the other day and saw a demo of their product and, you know, I was really, really impressed with what their, where their product was for a company I'd never heard of, yeah. uh, you know, going into the, the conversation. They had some customers and everything, but, you know, we asked some questions at the end and then we, then you asked, do you have any questions for us? And they said, well, what do you think, you know, where would you take it if you were us? And um, the feedback was like, you know, I, we're not seeing any major gaps in your product. I mean, it, it really, you've identified the area of identity, governance and administration is, is what you want to solve. You've got an excellent user interface. I mean, everything I've seen here, you got role-based management, et cetera, provisioning. Um, you just, now you need to market it on all fronts. You need to be at conferences. You need to be on YouTube. Um, I mean, that was one of my big feedbacks is that, you know, get out there on YouTube, have a YouTube channel, mm -hmm. do some chalk talks or whatever. I mean, there are so many uh, good kind of chalk talks that I find on YouTube and, and use them to educate myself. And even areas that I know, I like to go out and rewatch them because it just helps reinforce what you already know. So, I mean, to me, uh, YouTube is really where it's at. I think the more progressive companies have already made significant investments in their YouTube channel. And then you see a lot of the IM conferences, whether you're an attendee or not, you can get onto YouTube and watch a lot of the, a lot of the uh, presentations. So not as good as being there in person, but you know, you can't go to every conference. So if you're looking for avenues for educating yourself, I mean, and, and Jeff, I think we should be honest, right? We have 15 <laughs> years in the industry, but yeah. I mean, we can't go to every conference. We can't, so we use we use YouTube to educate ourselves, right? Yep, yep definitely. I'm always been more of a fan of show me versus just telling me. So anything where I can, you know, watch something, I find more one more interesting and more, you know, engaging. But if it's done correctly, can learn more about it. You know, don't just tell me why your product is better. Show me. Great. Right? Let let me see what it is you're trying to explain. What about? Um, a surprise that was a real eye-opener in terms of how it impacted the cloud maybe or identity and access management. Yeah, and so, you know, the real eye-openers for me are when I see something being done that it's like, wow, that's impressive and I don't see that every day. And so we were working with a client this year and they had, they were one of Amazon AWS's top 10 clients in the world. In other words, they had such a presence in the Amazon AWS cloud that they were ranked in the top 10. And I'm not sure exactly where in the top 10, but you know, the, the way that they were managing their cloud instances and the level of automation that they had put together was truly impressive. And now they were, you know, engaging with us to look at IM solutions. And so kind of coming out of of that, I came to two major conclusions. One was, you know, I really need to start to understand I am for DevOps. Like, what is the way to secure all these secrets that are being used by uh, their DevOps tools uh, to create instances and to deploy systems? So my second major light bulb, if you will, was that they, um, needed to be able to script integration with their IAM tools. So as they roll out new instances, 
Uh, they need to federate those instances back into their IDP. There's no room for manual configuration of these instances. Everything needs to be automated. When you're talking about a federation, it's there's steps occurring on both ends. It really needed to all be scriptable. So just, it, it kind of reinforced the need for APIs, but that was a major use case where I was saying, you know, look, this is this is something where the product needs to have this. This can't be a roadmap item or something like that. that it has to be ready to go and have some, you know, the vendor has to have some um, ability to talk about where they've really done this before. So I, I, that was a real eye opener to me. It was like, this is a company that is doing it at a scale and, and scripting and automating at, at a scale that I had not seen it done before. Yeah, I was impressed with that. And it always, it always interests me when I see something like that where they're super, like a, an organization is super advanced in a specific area like that. And they are way behind in other areas, <laughs> right? Right. I mean, they're you know it, they have all this stuff that they're working on from a DevOps type perspective, but they're still using you know someone manually going into Active Directory and creating employee accounts. You know, there's right. it's it's that's it's weird how sometimes I you know I, you see that out there. Well, you know, it's interesting for this particular client. They had identified that cloud was their future. They needed to be present in the cloud and without revealing who they are, their, their business model. Mm -hmm. This was something that they said, we're going to invest in. There's also a company that was full of very, very bright people. So they, yeah. they built a lot of this automation using open source tools and, and the things at their disposal. And they wrote a lot of code themselves and were kind of a, a developer type of company. So um, they had the, they had it in their genes to uh, make that happen. You know, the other thing that there's something you said to one of our clients today, which I thought was really right on. And this is something that will give an opportunity to, you know, make strides in one particular IM area sometimes, which is if a company is saying something like, we're going to, you know, revolutionize the digital experience for maybe for a website or maybe for the retail locations or for their factory you know, you can piggyback an IAM investment and, you know, making sure that IAM it doesn't become an afterthought in that process um, is important, but it's also a way to sometimes get things funded. And really it's not a, it's not a free for all, right? So you're not going to maybe be able to move forward the maturity of all of your IAM capabilities, but maybe one area like privilege access management or uh, authentication, something like that. Um, you have an opportunity to really, move the ball forward. Yeah, I think the key part is knowing when can you advance the ball and when do you need to kind of side pass it, right? <laughs> You're not right. going to be able to solve everything all at once. Some things may be quick wins and yeah, you can take care of it. And others are, you know what, let's tackle that one down the road. The The organization just isn't ready for that type of change. Yeah, I mean, that was an, that was an interesting conversation. And I've been through that in the past. So I kind of had some experience as far as, you know, what they were trying to do or what we were thinking about doing, but how it would kind of work in the real world. And, you know, let's take a step back here and let's think about this from how would this actually work from a deployment standpoint? It may be better to just let's, let's put a pin in that one and wait and then piggyback on it when the time is right, but be ready, right. To, to move forward when, when that happens. What about um, a situation where, um, you know, clients using some off the self off the shelf solutions and that's made things more challenging. Have you come across anything like that? Yeah, you know, I, I, one uh, thing that comes to mind was a client who, you know, had a very heavy legacy investment, um, in other words, mainframes, and they were running those mainframes on a variety of security solutions. So there was RACF, ACF2, uh, as well as some, some custom uh, security solutions that were more file-based. You know, in other words, when I say security solution, I'm talking about the management of the credentials to log into the applications, as well as, you know, how they manage roles and groups. And so it didn't change the overall, you know, requirement to manage by roles and to have an identity governance solution in place. Uh, but you knew there was going to be an integration challenge because I think what you'll find a lot of times when you look at product solutions is you might be lucky to get RACF and ACF2. You're never going to find a, you know, a Swiss Army knife connector for mainframe systems. A lot of times you're talking about, okay, well, how can we get a file moved over there? And 
you know, what is the way that we're going to do that? Um, but, you know, more, more than likely you're going to find just RECF, just ACF2, or maybe nothing. Uh, so, you know, integrating into the legacy environments can create a challenge. That was, that was one that came to mind. Do you have any that you're thinking of? I'm thinking more of like an open source um, kind of environment where you're heavily dependent on the open source community for all of your work. And maybe that's not necessarily the sweet spot that you want to be in. So typically open source, you probably have to do a lot of extra customizations, configurations, maybe even funding, you know, development of things, even though you're not paying for software, you're paying for software. <laughs> you know, you're not paying a license fee, but you're certainly paying a company or an organization, you know, or some sort of trade group to move forward with features that you're looking for. Um, and I think sometimes that makes it a challenge for some organizations where they get too dependent on that. And now they're maybe kind of locked into this kind of open source hell where it's just a combination of different things, not really designed to work together, but you've figured out a way to make it work for a few years. And now it becomes this tangled web that you're trying to unweave. And I can see that being a challenge. Um, yeah, because usually what happens in a place like that does that is, say, well, we don't have to spend any money on this. And they have a hundred developers working. <laughs> you know, it's like, right. yeah, you're not spending anything. Those <laughs> those folks don't cost anything, right? Or they're they don't have the features they're free, looking for, right? <laughs> they're hardly eating any of their free snacks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, um, yeah. yeah, but you know, another thing that I that I'll usually find uh, that will make implementing software, you know, out of the box, just the one use case that always drives a lot of difficulty with out of the box solutions is um, delegated administration, especially in like the B2B customer IAM space, being able to delegate administration to customers or to um, departments or anything. If the, you know, a lot of systems that have delegated administration, the kind of a very fixed um, structure that's in place. So, you know, I'm always out there. If you're listening and you found a, a, a COTS package or a SAS package where it's a really flexible delegated administration model, I'd love for you to bring that to my attention because I'm constantly looking for that. But in my years with uh, identity and access management, that's one of, been one of the toughest things to find and usually ends up with a fair amount of um, custom developed code. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it has to do too with um, what the company's trying to do from a from a you know customer type of acquisition thing. What's the workflow they want to have them go through, et cetera? I mean, there's some standard use cases out there, but it seems like everyone's looking to do something just a little bit different that maybe not be in a product. Sure. All right, why don't we start to close out? And I'll ask one final question: Ever a client that took all of our recommendations and ran with it, and if the answer is yes, if you could think of one, um, why do you think that that was so successful? So I think most of our clients take some of our recommendations and most end up, you know, not doing all of them. And I don't think it's because we, we didn't socialize it with them. It's that, you know, usually when you get further into the roadmap, you take on the harder things it winds up requiring more investment. And when it requires that you spend a lot of money, it has to go up the chain. So there was one particular client who um, I can think of that really followed everything almost to a T. They even had us come back for a second advisory um, you know, almost three years later. And at that point, they had gotten through. They were a little bit delayed on the roadmap, but they were doing everything that the roadmap said. And a couple things about it. One was that I thought that the roadmap was really well organized, centralized around three themes, um, standardization, simplification, and mandating. Mandating was the tough one. Mandating was, this, this was an environment where they had built kind of um, delegated, uh, or what would you call it? Um, like a distributed type? Yeah, it's just, they allowed a lot of autonomy to the, the application teams to determine how they wanted to implement security. And so they had multiple generations of security solutions. And um, so we said, look, you need to, man you're going to come up with this investment. You're going to standardize it. You're going to simplify it. Now you need to make sure that everybody's going to use it. And what, what I think really was the kicker was that 
we presented this strategy to their board of directors, this organization's board of directors. And these were very senior people. It was in the, the medical community. So a lot of these people were like, you know, doctors for 40 to 50 years. Like it was a little intimidating because you knew these people were like a hundred times smarter than you. Uh, but they, but only know, in their again, given area, Jim, you were the expert the, and I am. That's right. And that's what I had to remind myself was that this was my area. And I, I knew way more about it than they did. And they were, you know, totally receptive to what I had to say. And that's exactly how it went. And, you know, they, they really appreciated the information. They, they liked the content, they understood it. And um, that gave that, that gave the team the ability uh, to have the backing of the board of directors to go ahead and, and make the changes that they, they needed to make. So it was really gratifying. I mean, it was, one of those situations where, you know, you really feel good about the job you did. Yeah. Those are always, those are always the good ones. I always feel kind of good. That's like, okay, you know, we delivered this. It was, we did a great job. I feel comfortable in what was put out there. It makes sense. It's totally actionable, right? Realistic. It's not just boilerplate type stuff that you can get anywhere. Um, and it always bugs me when that goes really well. And then the momentum gets lost, right? They, they take too long to kind of get going with the plan. And even that momentum, I think you were kind of talking about before was, you know, you get a couple of years into a plan and momentum also continues to be sometimes a challenge. So you want to try and keep that going forward. And I think that's always one of the danger spots is when we're working with our customers, I was going to tell them, you know, coming out of advisory is a real danger spot. And that's something you want to watch out for because you're going to have this great plan. There's going to be a lot of, you know, interest and, and potential backing to move things forward. And then if you don't do anything with it, you run the risk of, just kind of falling into the same habits again, not get, not get anything done. If we wait too long, the strategy may not even be applicable anymore. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's something that you know, like to point out. It's like, Hey, you know, at some point we're going to walk out of here and it's going to be up to you to clear, you know, continue to carry the torch. So you want to be ready to do that. And future podcast topic should be to talk about the roadmaps. Um, roadmaps. But just as a little teaser, we always put our roadmaps together with do now, do next and do later. So do now are things that, you know, we leave on Thursday, you can start these things on Friday, really they could be in flight already. Uh, and it's a mix of things that are, you know, cleanup items, things that you can get started where you don't need any budget. And then there are, it's mixed that with, um, you know, you're, you're doing preparation, you're going and doing product evaluations and getting budget lined up so that when the next budget cycle hits, you're able to go ahead and, and, you know, purchase software or, or do a subscription and start deploying things in the do next phase. You got to set the table before you can eat dinner. That's How's a that? good point. I like it. You like that one? <laughs> All right. I think this is probably a pretty good spot to leave it for this week. Um, certainly appreciate everyone who's reached out, people who are listening, subscribing, feel free to share with your friends, please do. Um, you can always find us at identity at the center.com. And if you've got questions, feel free to email us at questions at identity at the center.com. And with that, we're going to go ahead and close out for this week and we'll talk to you in the next one. Thanks all. You've been listening to the identity at the center podcast to access all episodes, visit identity at the center.com.